Happy Lord's Day, everybody. Good morning. Well, first of all, um, to go over a beautiful and lovely women, mothers, that are here today and in our Zoom. Happy Mother's Day to all of you. Mwamwa <laughs> chuk now, also, of course, we remember those mothers, the, the women who've gone before us and went to the Lord. We also remember them. They're always in our hearts, and they're always in our memories. We will never forget them. And uh, as a way of thanking our mother, our precious mothers, the great woman of the Lord, let me read to you uh, first Proverbs chapter uh, 31. And this is God's word that highly describes you and that you really play an important role in our lives and in this world. So let me just read to you Proverbs 31 to all the great mothers, to all the great women. The Lord said, a wife of a uh, noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her task. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is splitting, but a woman just like you who fears the Lord is to be praised. And verse 31, for all of us men, for all of us children, the Lord said, honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. And to our dear ladies, dear women, God bless you. And can I call Brother Pete? Come up here. Since he is our song leader, repeat. Can you lead the song? Come here. <laughs> we will sing for you. Uh, it gives me an honor to sing to all the women in this world, those who go through all the ups and downs. and It's a big job, that's for sure. That's not only ups and downs, it's all the other things that comes with the family. Thank you for being you and thank you for being real and uh, the suffering that you go through. We'll sing this one for you. We love you with the love of the Lord. 
We love you with the love of the Lord. We see in you the glory of our King, and we love you with the love of the Lord. Thank you, Brother Pete. All right. So to our dear women, the Lord bless you and keep you, and we love you with the love of the Lord. That's from our hearts to you. Okay. Thank you, Brother Pete. Impromptu. Now, um, speaking of Mother's Day, tomorrow, May 15 here, uh, is our mom's supposedly 83rd birthday. Though she passed away almost 17 years ago, she is always remembered by her children. And when I read this Proverbs 31, you know, she's really that person. And I know that all of you are that person as well. Now, when we lost our mom, it was tough. In the family, she's the first one to leave us. And it took a great toll in all of us. And as we always say, life must go on for all of us. And for our sake and for our family's sake, we all need to mend our brokenness and start living our lives as it should be without her. Now this morning, as part of our brokenness series, we'll be, we will be talking about mending of brokenness. We will look into scriptures that will ultimately get us through with our brokenness. And personally, the scriptures that you will see this morning profoundly impacted my life uh, as I mend my own brokenness. Now, the most common question people ask when bad things happen, especially when you lose someone, is the question of why. Right? Many questions pops into our minds. You know, why our loved ones? Why now? Um, why this way? You know, our hearts you know, are pounding and racing and more often, our comprehension are clouded and disarrayed. We cannot think properly. Uh, thinking becomes really hard for all of us when we lose someone or when we are in that pile of mud, in that pit. Nothing can really prepare you for that moment. Even if you say, you know, I am ready, I, 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 I prepared myself. But when it happens, somehow you're not really ready. Now, just quickly, a, a, a psychiatrist born, a Swiss psychiatrist born, uh, and an author, she came up with this five stages that we all went or go through as we suffer in life, as we go into grief. And one of our discussion, I think, um, I made mention about this before, but let me go through it again. Uh, Kobler Ross, she made this the grief acceptance cycle. This is what we all go through in life, but some even more. But she said we go through denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Again, not every one of us will go through all these things, but some, again, some will have to go through, they say seven stages, eight stages, but the common stages that we go through in grief in our life is this five, okay? Denial, anger, bargaining, uh, and depression. Now, again, remember that your grief, as we are unique individual, it's different from one another. The number one, denial. It means we cling to a false sense of reality. Knowing all of this will help you cope up with your grief. And probably some of your friends are going through grief right now. You can help them by you know, learning this and trying to uh, convey it to them so that they can also go with their grief somehow at ease. Now, in the first stage of grief, there was what we call, or what you call denial. It says we cling to a false sense of reality. You are not living in actual reality. Rather, you are living in a preferable reality. You are living in the reality that you choose. Okay. 
In Genesis chapter 18, 10 to 15, then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Zara, your wife, will have a son. That the one talking here is an angel from the Lord. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out, that my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. Though both Sarah and Abraham, they knew God pretty well. But when the angel told that Sarah will give birth to a son come next year, Sarah, you know, laughed for the reason that they were already old, past the stage of giving birth. At this point, Sarah was in denial of having a son. Now, what she did, what she did was actually denying the fact that God can do anything. Okay. That's why the angel told Abraham, is anything too hard for the Lord? You see, Sarah was clinging to a false sense of reality and living in a preferable reality, which for her, that preferable reality is that at the time that she's barren, that she will never give birth to a son. That is what she preferred to live because they are old. And the mindset was that it will be hard for her and impossible for her to give birth. But the real or the actual reality is the angel told them that she will give birth to a son next year. And then she denied and said to the angel that she is not lying. Oftentimes, you know, we go to this first stage of our grief. In our grief, we deny. We are in denial of losing someone. Even when your loved one is right there with you, with the lifeless body, you know, somehow we deny the fact that they are dead. We deny the fact that no, she's not my mom, right? I can remember when I was holding my mom's hand, I was in denial. I was at this stage. You know, well, this is not my mom. Right. And I know my mom is back home. So my mind was like that. I'm in the hospital looking at her lifeless body, but I was actually denying that she's right in front of me. So at that stage, I was in denial. You know, in denial stage, people will have difficulty in comprehending the reality of loss. Denial is the first stage of grief, and it is a normal and temporary response that helps you cope with the shock and pain of losing someone important to you. It is a self-defense mechanism that gives your mind more time to adjust and, prop and process the reality of loss. There is no specific time for how long denial lasts, but it must be dissolved eventually. Now, the second process or cycle is anger, the need to blame someone, even blaming yourself for what happened. It is a natural response also, and a natural step in healing. In 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 33, the king was overcome with emotion. He went up to the room over the gateway and burst into tears. As, and as he went, he cried, Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, if only I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. This is actually David, King David. When his son Absalom died, he was bursting into tears. And in 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 4, also King David, but the king covered his face and cried out at the top of his voice, O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. The death of Absalom was one of the most tragic events in David's life. Okay. The, story, the, the, cry, the cry of David 
was not only filled with grief, but as translated in the Bible, his cry was one that was filled with so much bitterness and with so much anger. You know, you might look to blame others for the hardship, for the loss that you had, and even blame yourself for what happened. You might blame your family, you might blame yourself, and some even blame material things for what happened in their life. Now, David might be angry with his son Absalom because Absalom actually rebelled against David. So it might be that David was also angry at his son because he rebelled against him. That's why he died. Maybe. And somehow we find it incom incomprehensible of something like this could happen to all of us, especially when you are truly serving the Lord. If you are strong in faith, you might even start to question your belief in God. Where is God? And why this happens to me, even though I am a faithful servant of God. And many mental health professionals agree that anger is necessary stage of grief. It is not healthy to suppress or to suppress your, your, your feeling of anger. It is our natural response and a natural step in the healing process. According to, to very well mind. Anger allows us to express emotions with less fear of judgment or rejection. Anger seems to be the first thing we feel when we start to release emotions related to loss. Number three is bargaining. A person hopes that they can avoid the cause of grief. They try to bargain. Now, have you ever felt in your lifetime that you, somehow you cannot breathe and thinking that you're, you're having a heart attack. And then you went into, uh, you hyperventilate. You start to hyperventilate and then all of a sudden it's like you're, you're fainting, right? Sometimes when that happens, people start to bargain with God. Lord, please, not now. Lord, please help me. Please, if you help me now, if I survive this, I will change. I will be a better person, Lord. Right? We try to bargain with God because of what's happening to you at that moment. You see? And sometimes having a person, let's say in the hospital, okay, we go to one corner and then we pray to God. We bargain with God. And guess what? That happened to me. I bargained with God. When I saw my mom, I bargained with God. I bargained with him. I told God, take my life. Give my mom her life. That happens to me. I bargained with God. Don't take my life. My life for her. So somehow, in the process of our grief, we will come into bargaining with God. Somehow in the process of what's happening to you, you will come and bargain with God. But most people bargain with God because they don't want to lose their life because of out of selfish reason. And some bargain with God because of some good reason. But then again, in the cycle of our grief, we will come to bargain with God. Just like what happened to King David, as we have seen in, in the verse, he said, King David said, if only I had died instead of you, Absalom, my son. So somehow he was bargaining with God. If only I died and not you. But we have to remember again that every one of us, one way or the other, we will experience grief, pain, and suffering. 
And number two, uh, number four is depression. Depression, what's the point of moving on? Why bother living? And this is where the battle is really fierce. People will go into depression. Second Samuel chapter 2, 16, 17, David pleaded with God for the child. He went into bargaining with God. He fasted and spent the nights lying in sackcloth on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused and he would not eat any food with them. David bargained with God and he went into depression. He doesn't want to talk to anybody. When his son got ill with Bathsheba, she doesn't want to talk to anybody. She was so depressed of what happened to his son because his son got ill, got sick. So he went into seclusion, didn't want to eat, didn't want to talk to anybody, and he was depressed. You know, sometimes the world might seem too much for all of us and too overwhelming for you to face. That's why we go into depression. And this happened to me. Two years after my mom died, I was depressed. I don't know. All of a sudden, just like that, I don't want to go out. I don't want to go out. When I go out, I want to go back home again. I don't want to go to sleep. But when I sleep, I don't want to wake up anymore. Then when I wake up, I want to go back to sleep. I cannot go probably a block from our house. I was shaking. Depression, anxiety took a toll on me for how many months? I was depressed. See? But again, depression, anxiety, because of the overwhelming grief that we are feeling, somehow it will envelop you and try to overtake you. But again, we have to go to God to help us when that thing, when, when that uh, situation comes. And number five, acceptance. Accepting the true reality. Not in the sense that it's okay my husband died. Rather, my husband died, but I'm going to be okay. Now, in this stage, your emotions may begin to stabilize. You re-enter reality. You, you, you re-enter the now. The right here, right now. The acceptance, it doesn't mean the end of your grief. It's not. Sometimes you will have moments of sadness, which is actually longingness. And until now, I have, we have that longing of sadness. We have that, lo we have that feeling of longingness. When our mom died, when my brother died, when our father died, I can still you know, feel sad. Because of the longingness that you wanted to be with them. But acceptance, I already accepted the fact that they're gone. And I am okay. And I am okay that I have to live my life without them. And it is the fact of life. And God said that every one of us will soon you know, be home with him. And by, Lord, by the Lord's grace and mercy, someday... In the near future, or in the far future, I will also bid my farewell in this wonderful world. And that is a fact of life. And that's what we have to accept. Now, what helped me in coping up with grief, in trying to mend the brokenness that I had, I go back to the Bible. I went back to my faith. And the following helped me in mending the brokenness in me. We have to be strong in your faith. You have to be strong in your faith. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9, the Lord said, And be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world 
is going through the same kind of suffering you are. Now, God is telling me, be strong. God is telling you, be strong in your faith. Never let go of your faith. Never let go. Whatever you are going through. And this is important. As you accept the fact of the loss that you have, you have to go back to God. You have to relieve or you have to remind yourself again of that faith that you have in God and with God. Then God says, it is not only that you are going through all with all of the sufferings. Your fellow believers as well are going through the same suffering that you have right now. You are not alone. Now, it is okay that you went through with the five cycle of grief. God says your brothers and your sisters also went with the same cycle. Then next is that God told me that my grief will be for a little while. I have to hold on to my faith. And then he's telling me that my grief is for a little while. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. The, ob the objectivity of the revealed truth says that this sufferings, your sufferings, my sufferings will be for a little while. I went back to that truth. And I hold on to that truth. That God is telling me, Mike, your suffering will be for a little while. All of your suffering will be for a little while. Did we get that? For a little while. Your pain, your grief, your suffering will come to an end. It, it's not forever. Then after which God promises that he will restore, he will support, and he will strengthen you. Amen. See? Now in my depression... I remember telling myself, I belong to God. I don't belong in this depression. I must not fear. Why? God said, you are mine. God is telling you, you are mine. Isaiah 43, verse 1. In the scripture reading, God said, do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you. By my name, you are mine. Now, this verse tells us three important things. Number one, God's ownership to us is personal. God's ownership to us is personal because he says, I have called you by your name. Personal. He knows you by name. Number two, God's ownership is certain. Why? Because he seals it with the word, you are mine. You belong to me. Isn't that wonderful? And number three is that having known that you are personally known to and belong to God, this should take away our fear. That's why he said, do not be afraid. Because you are known to God. Because you belong to God. He's telling you, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And as I take my fear away, God's assurance inch by inch embraced me, comforted me, because I know God never left my side and is with me always. Because he tells me that he is with me. Isaiah 43 verse 2, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. Now, my dear brothers and sisters and friends, can you feel the abundancy of comfort in that verse? Can you see the, the comfort that God is trying to give all of us? Now, God reminded us, when you go through deep waters, God reminded me of the Red Sea. When the Israelites passed that Red Sea, God parted 
the sea. And when the Israelites crossed, have crossed, the waters came tumbling down, came crashing down to the Egyptians. It happened so that to display God's power. It happened so that to show God's power and to encourage the unbelieving Israelites to believe in the almighty God. And remember, he told us when you go through rivers of difficulty, there was a, a, an account in the Bible in Joshua chapter 3 that when the Ark of the Covenant came to the edge of the river, they stepped into the river, the water upstream that's supposed to, uh, to, to bring water to the Jordan, it stopped flowing. And the Bible said it stood up in a heap in Joshua chapter 3, 14 to 17. The water flowing down to the Dead Sea was completely cut off. So the people crossed the river near, uh, near Jericho and they went through the dry ground. Okay. The priest stood in the middle of the river on dry ground. They waited there while all the people of Israel walked across the Jordan River on dry land. See Now, God said, when you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. Remember our three amigos in Daniel, the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were thrown into the fiery furnace, but they were not burned. The flame did not burn them. You see, I was reminded by God of this verse in my difficulties that God is with me all the time. That God is with you all the time. The problem back then, I just didn't see him because of my fear. But when I reminded, when I was reminded by God, my fear disappeared. My depression disappeared. And as they say, it's all history. Then finally, God sealed it with three words why we should trust him. Now question, what little, what three little big words that we all want to hear from our loved ones? What three words, little big words that you want to hear from your loved ones? I love I love you. I love you all. And that's four. <laughs> I love you. You know what? God said, I love you to all of you. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 4. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you. God will, will go through all the trouble he will save you from the furnace, even if you walk on river, sea, you will not drown. Because God said, you are precious. God said that you are honored. God loved you. This motivates me to go on with my life and see life as beautiful despite my brokenness, because God loved me so much. Now, finally, it gave me comfort that after all of this, the tears, grief, pain, and suffering, it gives me comfort that I will share in his eternal glory. Going back to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, in his kindness, God called you to share in his glory. And he will place you in a firm foundation. Now, no firmer foundation would be comparable to this. John chapter 14, 1 and 3. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. 
can there be any firmer foundation than this, than to share eternal glory with God and be with God with his own, with your own mansion in heaven. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Because Jesus knew that in this life, you will have trouble. Your hearts will be troubled in many ways you cannot imagine. That's why he commanded us not to let that situations trouble you to the point of losing your faith. Why? Because Jesus does not want you to lose sight of what's coming ahead of you and for you. Jesus doesn't want you to lose sight, to lose focus on what's in store for you. And that is heaven with him, to share eternal glory with him. Now, my brothers, sisters, and friends, they say that life is like an onion. It has many layers. It's not always happy moments, right? As you peel it off, layers by layers, you, feel, you will find sometimes that there will be disappointments. You cannot always have it your own way. We, cannot, uh, we can only ask God, rather, we can only ask God for his mercy, for his grace, and for his favor. Life is like an onion. It will make you cry. Right? Now, the truth is that God will always be God, and God will always be true, whatever our response is. This truth must permeate into our hearts and minds in order to attain comfort and healing that God wants for all of us to have. Now, let me encourage all of us to always look through the pages of the Bible. Go back to your faith for comfort. For all of us who are still suffering, may I call upon you. If you need someone to talk to, I'm here. I am here. We are here. And for those of us who have friends who are suffering, let us know. Probably we can help. And for those who are not yet, uh, have not yet accepted the Lord, may I call upon you to come forward to accept our Lord Jesus Christ, receive his mercy, receive his grace. And let us continue to pray for one another. And let me leave all of you with this short poem that I made about my faith. My faith won't take away the pain but it helps to find my joy again. My faith won't take away the tears, but it helps to get rid of my fears. My faith won't take away the questions, but it helps to find my solutions. My faith tells me to trust in him no matter what. And indeed, it is foolishness to think not. This is my faith. Good morning. God bless all of us. Shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation?